Well, hello, Vineyard. Welcome. My name's Cameron Clark, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff at the church. Awesome. Hey, thank you for that. Uh, I want to take a second, welcome all of you. If this is your first time, second time, third time, or if you've been around here at the church for some time, but you still consider yourself a new a new person here at the church, welcome. We hope you're having a great experience. I know we got a great crew watching online, so hi. Hope you're doing well also. Um, if you've been around the church for at least a little bit of time, you've probably heard us talk about this program quite a bit. And so I'm going to talk about it again. <laughs> this is a great, this is one of the reasons why we talk about it so much is because just how important it is. This is our program. You should have received one if you're on site uh, just a few moments ago when you came to the auditorium. Uh, but especially if you're new, you should take advantage of this. If you open it up inside, there's some great information detailing about things you can experience uh, around the church as well as some ways to get plugged in and serve. And then on the back, there's some place to take notes. So definitely encourage you to take advantage of that. So if you haven't got one of these, I'd encourage you to head onto the back and grab one. All right, um, before we head into worship, I want to share a story with you. Is that okay? Can I share a story? Yes, please. Hey, he's excited. That's awesome. I can't promise you it's going to be great, but here we go. <laughs> um, earlier this week, I had an opportunity to spend a little bit more time with God than I normally do. And I, I knew this time was coming, and, and so... And so I, I started praying about what I wanted to do with this extra time. And this time that I had uh, extra, it wasn't just a small portion of time. It was, a, it was a pretty substantial amount of time that I had to spend time with God. And so I started praying about what I wanted to do with this time that I knew I was going to be able to spend with God. And so I had this idea that I was going to take a good amount of time, pretty much the whole time, and I had this big task. I don't want to say what it was, but I had this big task, and I said, I'm going to accomplish this in this amount of time. And so the day finally came, and I show up, and I'm, I, I place my Bible down, and I start praying, and I jump into this time with the Lord. About two hours gets in, and this is what I realize. I'm not going to be able to get this done. <laughs> It doesn't, like, I just knew there's no way that I'm going to be able to get done what I had set out to do. And in full transparency, there was a brief period of time where I felt a little ashamed. I felt like I had let the Lord down. I felt like, I felt like the Lord was, was upset with me. I'm not saying that he was, but it felt like that. It felt like the Lord might be upset with me. And then I had this spiritual awakening, if you will, like this moment where I realized something that it's not about what I can produce for God, when reality is God just wants to be with me. And God just wants me to want to be with him. So it's not what I can accomplish for him, it's about my heart's perspective of being in his presence, of being with him. And I share that story and I share that realization because the truth is when we walk into worship sometimes, when it's time to worship, when, it's, when we start singing, there's a lot of times we walk in with this expectation that I have to be like the person to my left or my right. I have to worship like that person or if I don't do that, I don't sound like them, I don't jump around like them, I can't do this. Listen, I want you to know that the Lord just wants you to be in his presence. The Lord just wants you to be thankful that you're in his house and we're able to worship him freely. He wants you to have a heart of recognition of who he is. And then from that, there's an outpouring of worship that he actually begins to meet you where you're at. Because that's who the Lord is. I was reminded of this promise in the book of John. It says this, this is a popular passage. This is towards the end of it. It said, remain in me as I also remain in you. That's, that's powerful right there because that's the Lord saying that I am with you. Remain with me. Dwell in my midst. Dwell in my presence. Hey, when you do that, I'm with you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. That's what our worship time should be about, aligning our hearts, our perspective on the Lord, knowing that he's not asking us to produce all this all this nonsense or be like the person around you. All he wants you to do is be in his presence. Be who he created you to be. And then from that heart's perspective, an outpouring of worship comes. So I hope that makes sense. He gets it. All right. <laughs> With that in mind, would you stand? I'm going to pray and we're going to head into worship. God, I know that was a lot.
going to be still for a moment because it may not have been what I just said that's going to get us to where you want us to be, but it may be this silence. God, I pray. God, I pray you show up and you do what only you can do, Father. What you can produce in this time of worship is not generated by what is spoken before worship starts. It's what happens when you show up and decide to do whatever you want to do. So God, we don't have to invite you here. You're welcome here already. So Father, show up and do what only you can do. God, thank you for who you are and the promises that you've given us. What we want, what our hearts desire, Father, is to be in your presence and that's what we're here doing. I've been up here a long time, God, trying to usher in the presence when I think the reality is, is you're already here. You're already here, you're already moving. And so, Father, what I ask, if there's anybody in the room that their heart may be somewhere else, it may be pointed in another direction, Father, I pray that you show up in their life and you point them in the direction of you, that your presence, dwelling in your presence, your peace, your love, your goodness, that is where they need to be. So, Father, be with us in this time of worship. Let us walk into this time of worship with excitement and joy and expectancy because you are a good, good, good Father. So Father, this time of worship is for you and we give it to you. It's in your name we pray, amen. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place, oh, I believe you are the way, the truth.
just feel like <laughs> we have an opportunity to, right now to worship the Lord. You guys know that Jesus is gonna come back someday and it's gonna be amazing. And he's gonna come and he's not gonna come in the form of a baby like he did thousands of years ago, but he's gonna come like with might and power. Like he's gonna ride on, the, he's gonna be riding on a horse. Like it's gonna be glorious. And I wanna worship, can we like worship God and just pretend like it's that moment right now? Cause he is like, he's seated in heaven right now. He's just as glorious now as he will be when he's gonna come. So let's just worship God. What we're gonna do is we're gonna sing through that second bridge. It starts with, cause death is just the doorway into resurrection life. We're gonna sing through that two times and we're just gonna get loud for Jesus and then we're gonna jump back into that chorus and sing Christ be magnified. Does that make sense? So let's picture Jesus like everyone right now. Picture Jesus. You might not even know what it looks like, but he's gonna come back someday. So we're gonna sing this together. His death is just the doorway into resurrection life. Cause death is just the doorway into resurrection life If I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints My heart will still be singing, my song will sing Cause death again, cause death is just the doorway our prayer this morning. That's our prayer, Father, that you be magnified in everything that we do. Wherever we are, wherever we go, whoever we're with, Father, we pray that you are magnified in every aspect of our lives. Father, we thank you for what you've done in this time of worship. I know it's hard to move on. We're going to, Father, but we just want to say thank you one more time. Not because we have to, but because we get to. We love you, Father. So God, thank you for this time of worship we've had. Our prayer as always is that it's been honoring and uplifting to you. So God, we pray all these things in your name. Amen, amen. Hey, thank you guys so much for worshiping with us. Cool, before we move on, I got two things. The first one is this, if you are in middle school, you can go ahead and head on to your core class. Your leader will meet you out in the atrium and take you to that. Everyone else, you got, how long do you got? Man, y'all are smart. Okay, 30 seconds, say hey to the people around you, give them a high five, whatever you're comfortable with, then you can have a seat.
everyone, I'm Ryan Cameron and I'm on staff here at The Vineyards. We're so glad you're here today. If you're new with us today, we hope you have a great experience. And if you have not filled out a Connect card, it might just be the best way to get connected with staff and others from the church. If you're on site, the card is in the seat back right in front of you and you can drop that off at the Welcome Center. And for those of you online, there are helpful links in the description. Let's talk light up the night for India. Last weekend, we introduced the envelopes for India wall in the atrium, and you all responded by taking and donating through two thirds of the envelopes. If you missed out, here's what you do. When you're ready to donate, you take an envelope, say, I'm ready, and I take envelope 159. I would then take that envelope and be responsible for filling the envelope with a $159 donation. I can do that myself, or I can ask some friends to pitch in together to fulfill that amount. We can then donate by card at the Resource Center or by placing cash or check in the envelope and putting that into one of the giving boxes throughout the building. And if all 200 envelopes are taken, together we will have helped raise over $20,000 before the benefit starts this Friday. And if you head over to the Vineyard app, you can see how much has been raised so far. At The Vineyard, we value loving Jesus, growing together, and giving back. And beyond the weekend, we try to give opportunities to do just that. Two of those are upcoming classes. First is how to get more from your Bible time. Many of us want to read the Bible more, but whether it's not knowing where to start or struggling to understand the relevance of what we read, if we're honest with ourselves, the struggle is real. If that's you, we have a 90-minute workshop coming up that aims at helping you get more from your Bible time. The second class is for anyone who's been hanging around the vineyard for a while or simply wants to learn more about who we are as a church. Your next step is Membership Essentials. It will answer pretty much any question you have about the vineyard, as well as provide an on-ramp to every volunteer team we have here at the church. Don't worry. Simply going through the two-hour class doesn't make you a member, but it should give you all of the answers you are looking for while deciding whether or not to make Vineyard your church home. We only do this a couple times a year, so if you haven't experienced this class yet, it is worth it. You can learn more and sign up at the Resource Center in the atrium, online, or in this weekend section of the Vineyard app. Now, before we go, for those on site, if you chose to keep a child with you and they get a little too restless, we ask that you take them out to the atrium where you can still watch and listen to the message out by the fireplace. And if you're watching online, I hope to see you soon. Thanks, Vineyard. Hey, you guys. My name's Mark Pope. I'm the lead pastor at the church. Good to see you. It's nice of you. We also want to welcome those joining online. We hope you're having a good day. A couple things I'd like to highlight before we get into the talk. Uh, one uh, is the uh, opportunity for membership essentials. So chances are, if you're doing church today, you take your spiritual life pretty seriously. And one of the things that you should take seriously is finding a home church and being connected at the home church. And so, uh, and also, if someone asks you about the church you go to, you should know something about it. Instead of like, well, I don't know. It'd be better if you knew some stuff. So that's some of the, uh, the reason we emphasize membership essentials. It'll help you know whether this surely is a good place for you. Uh, it'll also help you be more confident in what you might invite people to. You never know when you might have an opportunity to invite someone to church and they may have a question or two, you should know some answers to those questions. So that's next weekend following this service time. It's real easy to experience. It shouldn't be, it's, it's relatively painless. So hopefully you will uh, do that if you've not already. The other one was the, the, the hour and a half workshop how to get more from your Bible time. I think it was in, hopefully you paid attention to that uh, video announcement. Th that 90 minutes can give you some skills that will serve you for the rest of your life. 
even if you get a nugget or two or 12 like things, don't underestimate the value of learning some things on how to read and get things out of the Bible. So uh, with that, let's pause and pray uh, for the offering, shall we? God, we hope that our church time here has been honoring you so far, and many of us will financially give to you today, and we hope that that will be honoring to you as well. And as usual, I ask that you would give us as a church wisdom with any financial decision we need to make, because we'd really like to make the right decision every single time. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're going to be in the book of Genesis. We're actually going to be in two little sections, Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 3. So that's bizarro, right? We're going to have like Genesis in two chapters. Oh no, which I'm sure it's going to go crazy. So Genesis chapter 1 is where you should go. By the way, if you've ever struggled to find a book in the Bible, you can find this one. It's the first book in the Bible. You open up just three, four, five pages, you'll see it there, and you can be successful. Uh, Genesis chapter 1. I'll begin with a little uh, story. Uh, we have a f- family cabin that we got about seven years ago. It's kind of up in northern Michigan. Looks like this. It's a pretty simple place. Uh, but boy, we love it. If we ever get a chance to go up, we just love it. Family time. And uh, next to us, we're on a little lake, and next to us is another little family cabin that looks a little different than ours. <laughs> did, did you see the difference? Let's go back to our family cabin. Okay, see that? Oh, that's not. Okay, the next one, yeah, it's different. Can you tell? Yeah. Anyway, (laughs) so when we got the opportunity, by the way, ours was a little fixer-upper that we got seven years ago, and um, but we had, when we had our first conversation with our neighbors with the little bit nicer (laughs) deal, uh, within five minutes, I remember the advice they gave us. They said something like this, make sure you don't fix your cabin up too much. And uh, I, they went on to share what the heart behind their story. Because when they bought their, theirs is just a, it's a little extra place that they have during the summers. They went on to share when they bought theirs, they like did tons of stuff to it. And they did the rock walls and they made it. It's really a home. It's like it's a home. It's amazing. And, uh, and they did landscaping down, like, down by the little lake, and they did rock stairs, and they did a fire pit here, and, and they made all this. And basically what it seems, I don't know what's in their heart, but what it felt like they were trying to describe was, we made this simple blessing that was going to be wonderful. They made it so complex, it had, be- it had become a responsibility hassle. Does that make sense? And uh, uh, so I I use that to introduce a question that maybe will provoke something you've experienced in your life. Have you ever experienced a complexity crisis? And I kind of made that up, but it's when a good thing, a basic thing, kind of morphs into something that's less than life-giving. Some silly examples Maybe you enjoy baking, you like to make cupcakes for your friends, and then someone says, oh, you should do a business. And so then you start to, you know, you do a little side business, and it goes really well, and, and then the side business, you end up renting a place, and it becomes like a real business, and that goes so well that, that pretty soon, you know, you're, you're supposed to franchise, and, and somewhere, three, five, eight, ten years down the road, someone even mentions cupcakes, and you just want to throw up on them, because you're like, I hate cupcakes, and because it... Cause it does that make sense? It gets to this place where it's like you used, you lost touch with the original joy. It can happen in relationships where you find the love of your life. And then you get married and then you have kid one or kid two or kid three. And, and then they grow up and oh, and school starts and extracurricular things happen and then you never heard of travel sports and then that comes along in your life and other little things go and before you you know and then you got you know working and then you got to work overtime to do the whatever and all that happens and then at some point you're not sure what happened but the love of your life you know walks in after work and you say 
hey, babe, and, and they just go, whatever. Because <laughs> they forgot that we like each other or something. Um, I would submit to you that that kind of complexity, complexity crisis could be a word for it, that can happen with our relationship with God. We may have this awesome revelation and understanding that we need Jesus Christ as our Savior and that God loves us and he paid the price for forgiveness and we can be, be in relationship. But if we're not careful, some of the do's and the don'ts and the extras and the service and the spiritual warfare and the, oh gosh, I'm still working on that one sin I've been working at for 12 years and, and I should have led all my neighbors to Christ, but I don't, still don't even know their name can get complex and we can lose sight of the stuff that started us in this relationship with our God. I think maybe that happened in the book of Revelation chapter 2 where God is addressing a group of Christians. It's the church in Ephesus and he says, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. Look at that. Look at all the things they're doing. And by the way, doing these things are not bad. These are good things. I know your hard work, your perseverance. You're not tolerating wicked people. You're persevering. You've persevered. You've endured hardships. Not grown weary. And yet the next sentence, he says this. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first interpretation, you forgot about some of that basic initial stuff. So hold those thoughts. We are kicking off a series called Hello Dad, a fresh look at our Heavenly Father. And part of the hope for the next four or five weeks is to revisit, for some of us, It'll be revisiting things about God that when we hear them, we'll be like, oh, I knew that. Now, you may just have forgotten. But it's part of the wonderful attributes of our Heavenly Father. It also could be that we will teach or talk about some things that will be new to you and will bring clarity because we live in a world that is kind of unclear and oftentimes confused about what God is like. Amen? It can just be... People will tell you things about, oh, God is, and can I just tell you, sometimes it is wrong, but they heard it from somebody or it felt good to them, and it seems like it is just wrong stuff. I'm thinking about a tangent now, but I don't know if I should go on it. No, wait, don't, wait, I'm listening to God. Answer me, Lord. Nah, not today. Okay. Okay, just a little bit. No, I just remember sitting at a wedding one time, and, and I'm trying not to be too critical of the, uh, the pastor that was doing the wedding, but I'm going to go ahead and be critical of him. <laughs> he began to describe God, and he started saying, the, you know, the creator, or maybe you see him as the wind, or the wind and the life force of the mountain misty. And I, I was in the back going, what the heck are we talking about he's a real deity we can know who he and the problem was there was no footing to know God it was like it was we had just decided it was all the look at the squirrels and the that squirrel ain't God man what are we talking about the squirrels for sorry so that was a moment of so I took off my shoe in the middle of the wedding and I Hit him right here. And then I went up and said, by the way, you can, no, I didn't do any of that. You can know God. He sent his son Jesus so we can know him person. Back to the notes. Where are we in the notes? Hey, so we'll get some reminders about who God is and some clarity on some things that we should, God wants us to know these things about him. Um, by the way, we do have a book that might be helpful to some of us who don't, when we start talking about God as our father, we don't have a good history with a father or a father figure. And so if that's you, 
Uh, a friend of mine, Dan Kuyper, has written this, who he came out of a background where when you say, when you, if you'd say, God is your father, that wasn't a real pleasant thing for him. He's like, that's not winning my heart over. And so he, through his, he, through his relationship with God, learned some things about his real heavenly father that wasn't through the lens of the distorted, okay? So that just might be helpful to you. That's at the research. I think we still have some left. Today, we're going to look at the original story of God as a father, although he is not called a father in Genesis chapter 1 or chapter 3. He is basically giving birth to the universe. He's starting his earthly family, so I still think it's appropriate. Here's what's been going on in Genesis 1. It's the creation story. God has been speaking and creating like light in the sky and the earth and water and land and living creatures and the vegetation and plants and birds of the air and fish of the sea and animals that move along the ground. And toward the end of the sixth day, he gets to creating human beings, arguably his children. And here's what it says, beginning in verse 26. God said, let us make mankind in our Image. You might be thinking, what's, who's he talking to? In our image, this is an indication of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, already existed before. So he's, ta- he's talking amongst himself. Like, let's create them in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over every living creature that moves along the ground. That's one section we're going to learn about the Father with. The other section comes in chapter 3. It's just a little glimpse of the Father Uh, This is in the midst of sin is happening now, but we see this image of the father. It says in verse 8, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? So those are our two texts title of the talk is the original dad, uh, father God in the beginning. And so I got two ideas from this. Let's pray. Lord, I want to keep having more clarity on who you are. I pray that over the next several weeks you would minimize or dismiss confusion about who you are and help us to know you better. Build that foundation in our life, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. First idea from the Genesis 1 text is this. From the beginning, Father God, we're looking at his characteristics, Father God intended human greatness. He intended human greatness. Another way to think about that is when he created us, he, was, he had high expectations for us. I'm getting this, getting this from the text where it says, and God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. That raises the bar. So God is saying, let's make them like us. And when I think through that, God God is perfect, God is loving, God is absolutely just, he is holy, he knows everything, he rules over. So in the midst of that, he's saying, let's make, and by the way, another thing, he has just finished through a six-day process just speaking things into existence like this. Here's some pictures. God has just, the Trinity has just said, hey, here we go, he's done all this, this swirling and lights and the sky and the stars, by the way, and nothing's crashing into each other. How many of you know if we did that, like right away, it would be like, what we'd, have you ever had a whoops moment? Like, whoops, I guess we exploded that, right? He's done all this stuff perfectly, and then he says, now let's, like, let's make mankind in our image. Does this mean we are gods? No. Does it mean we have characteristics like God? Apparently, that's pretty high standard. 
Here's a fill in the blank. When God created us, his plan was for high capacity. High capacity. High capacity human beings, baby. We see it in the text. If you read, I'd encourage you to read the whole creation story where he creates all these animals. And then he says to, to Adam, you name them. He gives him responsibility. He didn't, ask, he didn't give assignments to any of the other creation. He says, you name them. And <laughs> there's no record of him saying this, but you got the skills, you can do this. What? Me? Yeah. Go ahead. Named all of them. He also gave Adam dominion, rule over the garden. You manage the garden. Yeah, God created it, but you manage it. You see the high expectation? Another thing is, maybe this is stretching it, but God, in every day of creation, at the end, he said, this was good. This is good. This is good. This is good. And he waits till the end, and then he creates human beings, and I think it's like, this is the best part. You could make that argument pretty easily. This is the best part. I want to also dwell on a side note. This is important theologically. Um, well, look at 1 Peter 2, 9, then I'll go on to where I was going. Here's what it says about human beings. Well, in this context, in the New Testament, this is a record of those who follow Jesus because they're forgiven for their sin and become children of God. It says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. And I want to dwell on the sp specialness. Is that a word? I don't know. Is that a word? Do you know what I mean when I say it? Okay. Specialness of us by clarifying something in the creation story. It'll come up on the screen, just so you know. God was done creating in, in, this, in this linear thinking of creating creation, he, there is a separation. He was done creating animals. Then he created mankind. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. He was done creating animals, and then he created mankind. In our world, our misinformed sections of our world, they're trying to mash that all together. Have you seen this? Oh, no, no, we are all, can I just clarify it like this? You're not an animal species. You're not. According to God and according to the scripture, you're not a species of animal. You are a special creation of God. And there's a difference. We may have some, we have the same creator, so animals may have hearts and legs and hair, whatever, you know, but, but don't ever be deceived and think that you are the same as an animal. We are not animals, you guys. We are created in the image of God. That's good news. It's a higher standard. And Regarding salvation, when we come to Jesus, <laughs> by the way, kind of coming to Jesus is an acknowledgement we haven't been living up to God's standards. We've been acting more like animals than we should. Amen? No? Do you need to talk about that? Okay, I will. <laughs> right? Have, you, have, have any of you done anything that was pretty animalistic? You know, like it was, you, yeah, well, we knew you had, Chris, but the rest of us, any. But salvation is the moment where you acknowledge, oh God, I have lived way under the standard. You created me in your image, and I have sinned and sinned and sinned. I've acted more like an animal than, my, than the, in the image of God. And then so we realize we have a need for forgiveness, and so we go to Jesus, and he restores our heart more back to what the created intention was. He says, I want you to be in my image. And I was thinking through salvation. When I, some of you know my story. I became a Christian when I was 20. And I just thought in a different frame of what some of those early experiences with God were like. Because God basically went to work on some of my animal-like sin stupidity stuff. Example. I had developed 
some significant skills in swearing at age 20. Pretty skilled. So I still remember, it was one of the reasons I knew God has changed, God is changing my life. Because I was sitting, I was at Mike Ben's house and we were playing pool. We played a lot of pool and I was over a pool shot and I, I hit the shot and I missed it. And so the F-bomb came out of my mouth. Like, boom, because that's what I've been doing, you know, probably three, four, five years through high school and into college. I developed the, the, the reaction of using that word. So I used it, and some of you have heard this story in a different form. It was like God snuggled up next to me over my right shoulder. I was on this side of the table, watched the ball not go in. And it's like God snuggled up next to me, and he said, you are my son, and you are not going to talk like that anymore. Now, I didn't hear him out loud. But I heard him. You ever heard God? You're like, why do I not lie? I heard him. And it was now, as I'm thinking about this whole animal thing, and you're, it was like he was saying, look, Mark, you are not an animal. You can control your tongue. Does that make sense? You're not an animal. You can control your tongue. He went to work on my moral life and said, you are not an animal. You can, com- you can control your, your hormones. You can control your urges. I've created you to be in the image of God. I didn't know all this at the time, but I think that's part of what he was doing. You're not supposed to live like that. You're supposed to live like me, he was saying. Financially, he started to work on my, my, uh, my selfishness. <laughs> and, and you're not an animal. All the stuff you have is not for you. It's to be, how many of you know God, the image of God? God is, a pers- God is a God who shares. He is not selfish. He is giving. By the way, in God's eyes, in God's response to us continuing to live less than in his image, I'm making the point, live like animals, you know, like, that stuff, it does not go well for those of us who just keep doing it. Uh, in Second Peter, I was in First and Second Peter this week during my personal Bible time, and I came across this text. It's describing people who ultimately will not be forgiven for their sin. They will be punished for all eternity because of the way they lived. They, they ignored God. They never asked forgiveness or repented of their sin. This is their destiny. Here's what it says. If It says, these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like, look at this, they're like unreasoning animals. Creatures of instinct. Animals have instinct. We are so far above that. Supposed to be. Born only to be caught and destroyed. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. You ever been there? Like it's only 10.30, but you're thinking about with eyes full of adultery. I mean, I'd like to have her. Oh, and her. Oh, her over there. Well, hi, what's your name? Just full of adultery. They seduce the unstable. Oh, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They're experts experts in greed. I got a bunch of money, but I'm an expert. I just want more and more and more and more and more and more. Not because I can help other people, just for me. That's an expert in greed. They have left a straight way and wandered off. I may be stretching this a little bit, but in the context of the talk this weekend, it's like, Can you put that up again? They've left the straight way. The straight way is you've been created in the image of God, my daughter. And I want you to live like me. That's the straight way. But these people have wandered off into the wilderness and acting like something we were not created to be. couple questions to bring this in the room. Am I living up to God's creative intentions? 
Like he's called us to be children of God in his image. Am I working at that? Yes, we will fail. <laughs> but are we working at it? By the way, if you make a mistake this week, if you're in Christ, you just turn to Jesus and say, I'm so sorry. Forgive me, I made a mistake. If you're making mistakes and you're justifying your mistakes and you're just living in them, oh, it's okay, it's no big deal. God will forgive me anyway. Look out. Look out. Don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. God's not an idiot. <laughs> there, you write that down. My pastor's really smart. He told me that God was not an idiot. God is not an idiot. That we can do whatever we want, whenever we want to do it, and he's got to let us into heaven. There's no way. Second question is, am I living with a high view of my potential? God sees great stuff in you, and he'll call it out. He regularly through the Bible sees people, and he'll see them have more skills than they actually see in themselves. Moses, God said, I want you to lead my people. And Moses like, there's no way I can do that. God was like, yes, you can. I took a long time in that point. Second point. From the beginning, Father God exhibited some relational patience. This is a warmer side of God, a relational side of God. I'll start with a story before we get to the text. When my, when our, when our oldest daughter, hey, that was almost on cue, except for that's a little boy. Hey, buddy. Uh, when our oldest daughter was born, that was my father, my, my mom and dad's first experience with being grandparents. And I still remember something happened to my dad when he became a grandpa. Have you ever seen this happen? It's like, it's like the guy drinks grandpa Kool-Aid and all of a sudden I'm like, who are you? I remember coming around, we were visiting my parents, and uh, my daughter, Leah, was a toddler, just, you know, just, you know, walking around kind of a thing, and, and I came around the backyard, it was in the summertime, and I looked out, and there was my dad walking around with my daughter, Leah, and this, like, just doing this. And they would talk. And it was just, I remember, by the way, here's a picture. This is not them. But it looked, it was one, this kind of a thing. And I remember coming around there and watching and like thinking, what's the agenda? What are you doing? Because they weren't doing much. And it was like, I don't know how long, 20 minutes? It seemed like an hour. I'm like, what are you guys, what are they doing out there? And I remember actually saying to my dad something like, Dad, what are you guys doing? And he, what he, and, and here's what he did. He went. <laughs> just, just, I don't know, looking at the grass. Get out of here. We're just looking at the grass. Just look. At the, you know what I mean? Now, here's what I would submit to you. There's some of that grandpa thing in our Heavenly Father. There's some of that grandpa thing in our Heavenly Father. In our chapter 3 text, Man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And I connect that to verse 9 where the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And I'm, I might be stretching it, but it feels like there's a heart of God saying, my work is done. The day is done. It's the cool of the day. And I was hoping we'd be hanging out, but I can't find you. What's the agenda? That just finding you. That just, it's just that time of day where I thought we would just want to walk around with my kids, my kid, my child. You can write this down. The father was fairly unplugged during this moment in history in, in, in a garden. He's fairly unplugged in hopes of making room. Making room in his life with, for Adam and Eve. Just making room. By the way, it's not emphasized in the story of the Gospels and of Jesus, but there are moments in Jesus' ministry where he pulled back. And maybe, maybe it was a little bit like he's just walking in the garden in the cool of the day. There are not a lot of them. Jesus was pretty intense. But a couple in Mark 6.31 
says so many people were coming and going that they did not have enough chance, didn't have a chance to eat. And so he said to them, which is his disciples, his spiritual sons, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. It's kind of like, it's come with me, it's the cool of the day, we're going to go chill somewhere. couple more examples in Mark 14. It describes Jesus as he's in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper. What's he doing? Sitting at the table. John 13 is the last supper. He's washed the disciples' feet. He knows one of them will betray him. He's just shared that with them. And in verse 23, it says, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. And then this is an interesting, this is interesting imagery. It says the disciple, it was John, the apostle John. It says, leaning back against Jesus, he asked. So I don't know exactly how this worked, but Jesus is sitting at the table. They would sit typically on the floor with maybe some pillow. And, and John has a question about what Jesus just said. And so it, it, it's like he leaned, I picture him, he leaned back against the chest of Jesus and said, Jesus, I have a question. And what's not in the text, and I'll bet didn't happen, Jesus did not say, get off me, man, I'm the Lord of the universe. There should always be personal space between us. It's not there. He leaned, perhaps, we don't know exactly what it looked like, but there is strong, and he just leaned into Jesus, onto his shoulder, into his back, and said, I got a question. Maybe, like, I got a question, Dad. Jesus like, "Uh uh-huh. John 15, 15, Jesus said to his disciples, his spiritual sons. By the way, he would say to you, daughter, if you're, a da- if you're serious, if you're following Jesus, son, if you're following Jesus, he would say this to you. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. Last fill in the blank. Jesus didn't just come to save the world, but to connect with his kids. That's what our Father is like. Jesus didn't come, just come to save the world, but to connect with his kids. So a couple applications as we close. One is, if you're doing something that is less than the image of God this week, you should quit it. You should say, Lord, help me not be like an animal. And listen for his voice. Let him call you up. You can be like him in his image. And then the other thing is, this week, wouldn't it be great if every one of us, online here, if every one of us, there was a moment in our week where we walked with God in the cool of the day. God forbid that God's walking around and on his heart regularly is, where's my son? Like that's, he doesn't deserve that. Where's my daughter? Where are you guys? So just make, I don't want to lower him into like he's needy, but how about we make his day? And go sit someplace, go walk, go find a place outside of the apartment complex, go someplace Go to a place and just sit there and just decide, I'm going to go sit with God in the cool of the day. I'm going to walk with God. Who knows how we might interact with God? Who knows what he might say if the agenda would go down and we were just sitting with him? Who knows? Why don't you stand and we'll close?